Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn-Kennedy, the Holocaust Center's Director of Education. Thank you to our community partner on today's program, the Moisha House of Seattle. The views, information, or opinions expressed in these programs are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the Holocaust Center for Humanity. This program is being recorded and will be available on our website starting tomorrow. We at the Holocaust Center for Humanity acknowledge that our Holocaust Center is on the ancestral lands of the Duwamish people, the first people of Seattle. When you are at a turning point, do you recognize it when you are in the midst of it? Or is it only after the fact that we are able to reflect on it and see the larger context that we can see it as such. I believe we are in a moment that will become a turning point in history, a moment that in 50 to 100 years from now will be judged by future generations. We have an opportunity in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a stressful and historically close election, in the midst of divisions, stay at home orders, and an economic and social crisis. We have the opportunity to create the direction of this turning point. Today marks the 82nd anniversary of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, the November pogrom. The night of November 9th through 10th, 1938, was a turning point for Jews in Nazi Germany. Often referred to as Kristallnacht, the preferred terminology is shifting to November pogrom. Moshe Zimmerman, professor emeritus of German history at the Hebrew University writes, that the use of Kristallnacht gives the impression that it was just broken glass, which detracts from the importance of the event. Zimmerman argues that if, quote, the traditional approach has been to relate first and primarily to an image of burned synagogues, that perception should be replaced by one of a German crowd that watches as lines of Jews are being sent out of town to concentration camps by way of Main Street. In estimated 7,500 Jewish shops were vandalized and looted, synagogues burned throughout the night as people and firefighters watched, having been directed to intervene only to prevent flames from spreading to nearby buildings. And 30,000 Jewish men were rounded up and arrested specifically because they were Jewish. The November program was a turning point in the escalation of the Holocaust. The way most German citizens responded to the violence on this night, their passivity or their willingness to engage, signaled their support and emboldened the Nazi regime. It also signaled to Jews that worse was yet to come. In the wake of Kristallnacht, Jews began to search more desperately for ways to leave Germany. Edwin and Berta Lewinson, with their one-year-old son living in Germany, were one such family. Their store was vandalized during the November pogrom and Edwin arrested and imprisoned for weeks in the Buchenwald concentration camp. Upon Edwin's release, the Lewinsons fled with their son Joe to the only place they could, Shanghai. Joe grew up in what became the Shanghai ghetto, an enclave of Jewish refugees struggling to survive. Joe, thank you so much for being with us today to share your experiences and your family stories. Joe will take questions at the end of the program. Please use the Q&A option on your screen to type in questions at any time. And if you are watching on Facebook Live, please enter those questions into the comments. Thank you so much, Joe, for being with us and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Actually, my German name is Joachim. And in South America, I've turned to Joaquin and Finally, my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Bradley, named me Joe. So I really want to thank the Holocaust Center today for hosting me to talk to you about the Holocaust and its impact on my family. In 1939, two years after I was born, my family embarked on a journey that took 18 years to complete, from being stateless to citizenship in this country. This journey took us to three different countries, covered approximately 35,000 miles by boat, train, planes, and buses. It's a journey that we took fleeing the Holocaust and becoming refugees. 
And on this journey, you're going to meet my family, uh, those who survived and those who perished in the Holocaust. But before I do that, I need to answer a question that I was asked. Why did you become a speaker? And well, the Holocaust Center heard that I was a survivor, so they interviewed me and they suggested that I should become a speaker. And my first reaction was, no way. No way was I going to uh, share intimate details of my life and dredge up painful memories. But then I remembered several quotations that made me change my mind. And one of those quotations came from Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, he said that we will not remember the words of our enemies, but we will remember the silence of our friends. And then there came this quotation that I remembered. First, it came for the socialists. And I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. And then it came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. And Martin Niemöller was correct. The Nazis did come for him, and they incarcerated him for seven years in a concentration camp. So the question is, what do these two quotations have in common by Martin Luther King and Martin Niemöller? Well, what they have in common is a deeper understanding of the Holocaust. And if you don't remember anything about the Holocaust, there are only two words that you need to remember. And those two words are indifference and self-interest. So it is fair to say that um, most Germans before Hitler weren't anti-Semites, but they became anti-Semites when they became Nazis. When my parents' friends and neighbors saw how the Nazis humiliated, degraded, accosted, and destroyed my parents' property, then they were guilty. They were guilty in a conspiracy of silence, and they were guilty in the face of evil. So the question comes back is, why did I become a speaker? Well, the Holocaust Center gave me an opportunity to speak up or to say nothing. So I decided that I wanted to speak up no matter how uncomfortable it gets. I wanted to bear witness to the events of the Holocaust in spite of the deniers, the minimalists, and the revisionists who want to paint a different picture of the Holocaust. I also wanted to uh, bear witness to the six million that passed away and to members of my family that were murdered because they were Jews. Okay, Richard, next please. Okay, uh, this is a uh, picture here of Germany. Next one, Richard. And I was born in Belinchen on May 16th, 1937. And my family lived in Mark Friedland with my sister Rosie. Okay. Now I'd like you to meet my mom, my family. This is in the middle is my mother. Her name is Berta. She was born in 1903. And uh, my mom was the most resilient person that I know. She had undaunted courage in the face of adversity, which was reflected in some of a couple of things that she always told me. She said to me, es ist wie es ist und man macht das Beste, was man kann. It is what it is, and one does the best one can. And the other thing that she always told me was, so wie man sich bettet, muss man schlafen und pass auf. As you make your bed, you must uh, sleep and you better pay attention. And right below it was my mother's brother who accompanied us in Shanghai and then wound up here in Seattle. Now, my mother's brother, my mother's father was a kosher butcher. And every day the rabbi would come and he would stamp the meat kosher. And then my grandfather, would get on his horse and buggy and distribute his wares to the clients. My mom had a basic education, which stopped at the age of 13. 
and her parents wanted her to learn how to run a business, which meant that she had to become an apprentice, move away from home, move away into another city, and get room and board, and she would learn how to run a business. Many times she told me that she cried bitter tears to implore her parents not to send her away. And, but that's what happened. And when her father passed away, then uh, she had to return home and to help run the business. Next, please. Richard, next one. Okay, now this is my dad, the little guy standing there. Both my mom and my dad weren't very tall people. They were about five feet, four inches tall. And on the left here sitting there is my dad's brother. Now my dad was sort of the uh, different kind of personality that my mom was. My mom was kind of pushy and aggressive. And my dad was more passive aggressive and he always kind of settled things down. And his education also stopped at the age of 13 and he apprenticed to become a butcher. But when the war broke out in 1914, as you can see, he became, he went into the army. And on the right hand side are the, his military passport and some of the battles that my dad fought in the Second World War. Now, when my dad enter, entered the army in 1914, the Jewish population in Germany was less than one half of 1%. And over 100,000 Jews fought in the First World War. Proportionately, more Jews fought in the First World War than non-Jews, of which 10,000 were killed, including my dad's brother, my uncle, and 30,000 came back decorated as heroes. Okay, Richard? Next, please. And my dad came home and he was a war hero. On the right hand side, you see the Iron Cross that my dad won. And on the left hand side, he won the, cro um, the uh, Cross of Honor. And in the middle here is a certificate showing that in the name of the Führer, which meant Adolf Hitler, und Reichskanzlers, and Hindenburg, this certificate. These medals were awarded to my father uh, in 1935 for Frontkämpfer, and um, which was in the infantry. Okay, so he was a war hero. Next, please. Now, what kind of Germany was it that my dad came home to? It was certainly different than the Germany in 1914. Germany lost the war. They had to make huge reparation payments. They uh, lost vital territory, coal producing territory to the uh, French. Um, <clears throat> yeah, they faced um, hyperinflation where money was worthless, millions of people unemployed, including all the veterans that came from the, um, from the war. And the army manufactured the myth that they were stabbed in the back and they never lost the war. It was defeatism at home caused by the Jews, by communists, by the socialists that caused the army to lose the war. So under these kinds of conditions, political and economic, uh, the um, gave rise to the Nazi party and anti-Semitism in the 1920s. Okay, next slide, Richard. Now in 1929, my dad and my mom met and they got married. Check out the uh, wedding dress that my mom is wearing. Anyway, uh, so they got married in 1929, which was an auspicious year, not just because they got married, but you had the stock market crash here in the United States, which affected the entire world, including Germany's recovery. Okay, next one. And go on back, Richard. Go back, please. Okay. And in 1930, um, my sister Rosie was born, and that became part, became the start of the family. Okay. Now, 19, next one, please. 
So in the 1930s, um, when Hitler was consolidating his power, they were still really concerned about uh, <clears throat> progress, um, the social, their social standing and in the world because of the Olympics were coming in 1936 to, uh, to Germany. So anti-Semitism was very oppressive, but it was not necessarily violent. And so my family operated a store. And there you see my dad standing there in the middle of the store and my uncle and my cousins. And on the left-hand side are my grandparents and their daughter. So, so even though with anti-Semitism being very oppressive, we were able to operate the store and still make a living. Okay, next slide too. Next, please. So in 1933, was Hitler coming to power and the, um, <clears throat> and the Jews losing their citizenship as well as the civil rights. This came into 1939, please. Next slide. And I was born in 1937. And here you see the uh, certificate of my birth with the Nazi emblem right here. Okay, next slide. So in 1938 was the advent of Kristallnacht and synagogues being burned. My parents were looking out of their room, their uh, home in the window, and they saw smoke coming in the direction of our synagogue. So my dad went to investigate where the smoke was from, uh, coming from, and he saw that the synagogue was being torched by the Nazis. And the Nazis saw my dad and they said, they start yelling at him, schmeißt den dreckigen Juden ins Feuer, throw the dirty Jew into the fire. And my dad didn't come home that afternoon. He didn't come home that evening or the next day. We never knew whether or not they threw him into the fire, whether they killed him, what happened to him. And we became very, very frantic. And my mother went ahead and started looking for my dad in different, build, different administration buildings, different police stations. And everywhere she went, she heard the same phrase, get out of here, you dirty Jewess. And she was finally able to locate my dad in Buchenwald, concentration camp where he's been for a number of weeks. Okay, next slide. So, next slide, please. So anyway, uh, they wouldn't release my dad. And so my mom took the, uh, his medals and the certificate to Buchenwald. And they saw that my dad was a war hero and they finally released him on the condition that we leave Germany. But there was one other incident that prompted us to leave Germany much faster. And I need to tell you to move ahead a little bit and tell you about a movie that I talked my mom to, my parents to the sea here in the States. It was The Sound of Music. And I'm sure most of you have seen The Sound of Music. Anyway, I... Um, saw my parents a few days later and I asked my mom, how did you like the sound of music? And she said that she was not able to sleep for a number of nights after she saw the movie. And I asked her, well, why is that? And she said, you know, do you remember that one scene in the movie where the Von Trapp family is escaping and they were hiding in a uh, cemetery in a convent behind headstones? And I said, yeah, I remember that. And the girl recognized one of her friends who's now a Nazi and she wanted to yell out to him. And the uh, mom took her hand and she cupped it over her mouth. And I said, yeah, I remember that. She said, that's exactly what I did to you. Exactly what I did to you. The Nazis were rampaging, coming down the street, destroying property, looking for Jews to beat up or maybe kill. They came into our store and we had a false addict that we went in to hide and we could hear them destroying our property. And um, 
you were just two years old and um, you were squirming, you were starting to cry, and I took my hand and I cupped it over your mouth and I couldn't let up, I couldn't let up, I couldn't let up, and you were having difficulty breathing, you were even turning blue a little bit, but I couldn't let up. And finally, when the, uh, you know, the Nazis left the store, uh, she was able to release me. Imagine, um, just imagine listening to your mother and she was telling you the story that she couldn't let up and she couldn't let up and she didn't know what was going to happen. But I can still see, even right now, I can still see the anguish in my mom's face and the tenseness in her body as she told me the story. It was uh, just horrid, just horrid. Okay, next picture. Uh, next picture. So we decided that it was time for us to leave <coughs> Germany and we had a conference with our, the remaining relatives. The, the picture that you saw was my grandparents and cousins and they decided that they didn't want to go to Jordan, Shanghai, which was now open and you didn't need any um, papers. And they um, decided to stay because they had all their properties there. They didn't want to leave. Their thing was they didn't want to work for a bowl of rice. So all of them decided to stay and we never heard from them anymore. And we, uh, we left and they stayed and we assumed that they were taken and they were killed. So we left for Shanghai, which was now occupied by the Japanese since 1937. And the only thing that we could take with us was 10 American dollars and two, two suitcases. So imagine leaving everything behind and you walk on a boat and all you had with you was a clothes on your back. So we left from Hamburg and we arrived in Shanghai several weeks later. Okay, next story. So this is the passport that my, we had when we left Germany. And you can see the red J, which stands for Jude. And also they give a debarkation date. Okay, right there. And we arrived in Shanghai in 1939, and uh, I was two years old. Okay. So here we are on the boat, and on the left hand picture, well down below, is my mother and I, and my sister Rosie on the boat, and my uncle accompanied us, and the Uzaramo ship is the one that we took that took us to Shanghai. And every place the boat stopped, and it took several weeks, my mom got off the boat, she bought as many cigarettes as she could, and then when she went back on board boat, uh, then she was able to sell it at a profit. Okay, next boat, next ship, I mean, next picture. Okay, so we arrived in Shanghai in 1939, with 18,000 Jews at that time left uh, Germany to go into Shanghai. There was nobody to greet us. We didn't have any friends or family to precede us. And uh, we were either, and most of the uh, people that were housed were housed in missionary tile barracks or in barracks. And if you were housed in a barrack, those were really atrocious, disease-infested living conditions. You had probably maybe 100 people, men, women, and children living together in a barrack uh, with bunk beds separated by a few feet. There was no running water. There was no um, toilet facilities. And all you had was waste buckets. So there was really, really unhealthy living conditions. But we were more fortunate we were assigned to a room. Now, I'm not sure exactly how we got the room, but we were got a room in the Hongshu ghetto. Next, uh, next picture, please. Okay, so the Hongshu district 
was one of the poorest district in Shanghai. It was about one square mile and it had about 100,000 Chinese already living in there. And we found a room and lo and behold, when we got into the room, we realized there were already three other families living in this room and we were number four. So there were 12 people living in the room. So how do four, four families live in one room? Well, a, a room has four walls. So we had, each, each family had one way, a corner of the wall with bunk beds, with my mom at the bottom, then came my dad, then came my sister, and then I came. And the only privacy that you had was the curtain that you pulled over your corner of the room, and that was it. So from 1939 to 1947, that is what we called home. The room had no bathroom facilities, no running water, no cooking facilities. It just had a table and chairs, and that was it. So um, my parents decided that they were going to go into business and they bought eggs from the Chinese. And um, they went around to the community seven days a week, no, regardless of the weather or what was going on, since China was already occupied by the Japanese. And every place they went, they sold their eggs out and they were able to, with the profit that they made, they were able to bring home some extra food. Now in the top, lab, top left hand corner, you see people peeling potatoes and working in the kitchen. And there was a community kitchen where you could go to where you were guaranteed at least one meal a day. And my mom and my dad had to go there and they had to peel potatoes. And everybody worked in the room. And so the basic staple for, for a meal was either beans, rice, and potatoes. So you had beans and rice, black beans one day, red beans another day. And that was the staple that we ate almost every day. Very few vegetables, very few meat. Everybody complained that the cooks ate all the meat and vegetables and left us to eat the beans and the rice and the potatoes. So everybody was really, really very hungry all the time. I remember just being very hungry. So our movements were not restricted. So my sister went to school. She was seven years older than I was. And she went to the Kaduri school, which was really a nice school. And she learned, uh, she even learned English. As far as I'm concerned, I never went to school. I was dumped into a daycare center, which was not education. It was a babysitting center. And when my sister was finished with school, then she, uh, was in charge of me. She brought me home and she was like my mom and dad until they came home and brought home some extra food. I remember that my dad in the room had a little kerosene stove and whenever he wanted to cook something, he had to pump, it up, pump up the kerosene stove and we were able to get some hot water and some food to eat besides what we had there. Now, uh, in 1940, our movements were not restricted, but that began to change. In 1945, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and the Second World War, a certain Second World War broke out, then um, the Japanese um, aligned themselves with the Axis power, Germany and Italy, and our movements became very, very restrictive. Uh, there were checkpoints that we had to go through and there were guards there and you had to show papers. And then towards the end of the war, as the uh, war was moving more towards uh, Japan, we could hear American bombers coming over. And uh, they were coming over almost daily and you could hear the sirens. And once the sirens blared, then my parents would yell to us, go play hide and seek, go play hide and seek. And that meant that uh, my sister and I and all the kids in the room had to go underneath the bunk beds and um, simply uh, stay there and hopefully a bomb wouldn't hit us and no debris would fall on our heads. But that changed towards 1945 and June of 1945, uh, the bombers came over and bombs hit the Hongqiu ghetto and there were around 350 people 
that were killed and thousands were injured. And luckily, uh, we survived the bombing. Okay, next slide. So the bomb, when the war was over, two weeks after the uh, bombing of the Hankyu ghetto, uh, the uh, bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed, and the war became over, and Americans, GIs, came into Shanghai and that liberated the city. So my dad went to work for the United States Army, and this little guy who was only five feet six inches, I mean five feet two, or five feet three, began driving a two and a half ton truck. He could hardly look over the hood of the truck, but he was able to drive it. And we had uh, gotten papers from our family, from relatives of our family who were living in Santiago. And so, we, at the end of the war, 1940, 1947, my father got from the Yiddish Gemeinde a statement saying that he was a farmer, which let us out earlier because the entire world wanted to have farmers. So we were able to get out in 1947, whereas most of the other Jews got out in 1949. And so what we did was we started to head towards Santiago. And uh, so, the same two suitcases that we brought from Germany, we packed those up again, and with those two suitcases and the, uh, uh, and the clothes that we had on our back, we got on the ship again, and that took us from Shanghai to um, Hawaii, whoops, to Hawaii, and from Hawaii, we landed in San Francisco. Yeah. Now take a look at these two pictures, and the one on the right is San Francisco in 1947, and the one on the left is uh, in Shanghai. It was a real culture shock for us to come to San Francisco. And what do we see? We see cleared streets, we see cars, we see not very many people compared to Shanghai, where you had rickshaws, a mass of humanity walking back and forth. And as we're driving to our hotel, which uh, was sponsored by the Jewish community in San Francisco, uh, we saw people in a restaurant, which I've never seen before. And they put us up in a, um, uh, in a hotel. And we walk into a hotel, at least, uh, and I look around, and there's furniture there, there's a rug, there's a kitchen. The first question I ask my mom is, where are the other four families? There's three other families living in this room. And she said, there are none. I go into the kitchen and I say, was ist das? Das ist ein Kühlschrank, that's a refrigerator. And I open it up and there's food in it, it's cold, there's a light. I've never seen a refrigerator before. Maybe the only one I saw was a small, was a small refrigerator, it was ice cooled. I go into the other side of the uh, kitchen and I look at that and I say, was ist das? And they say, das ist dein Herd. That's a stove, don't touch it, you'll get burned. And then uh, I go into the bathroom, I see a toilet and running water. Well, I didn't see a toilet or running water in our room. If you wanted to use the toilet, you had to leave the room, which was always crowded, or use the waste bags. I never saw running water before. And that evening, I go into a room, and there's a bed, not a bunk bed, but a mat with a solid mattress. And I can't fall asleep that evening. And why not? And uh, I'm waiting for the sirens. I'm waiting for the bombers. I'm waiting to play hide and seek, and you're 10 years old, and you have never experienced anything like that before. We were two weeks in San Francisco, and one of the things they took us to was a zoo. Whoa, 10 years old, you've never been to a zoo before. The only animals that I saw were chickens, dogs, cats, and rats that were eaten, maybe a horse, but you saw burros but never seen a wild animal before, never seen a live tiger or an elephant, and you're 10 years old. Imagine that. Unfortunately, we couldn't stay in uh, San Francisco, so we had to take a train 
and that took us down to Miami. And from Miami, we took a plane down to Santiago. So here we are in Santiago, and our relatives meet us there, and they put us up in a small apartment on Antofagasta Street. Go ahead, Richard. Next. Okay, these are uh, the passports that, that my mom and my dad used to uh, get into Chile in 1947. So we lived in Santiago in Chile in 1947, and lo and behold, welcome. We didn't know anything about Santiago. We couldn't speak a word of Spanish and um, didn't know anything culture, even how to make change or recognize any money. So my mom decided that she was going to bake German pastry, in this case here, Pfeffernissen. My mom was a great cook and she was a great baker. So my dad fashioned her a box and every single day, seven days a week, she was baking. And then she took her wares and she went around the neighborhood and started selling her cook, her, her baked goods. Imagine, you don't know anything about the city. You don't even know where you're going and you're knocking on strange doors. You can't say anything like, would you like to buy this? She just showed it and people did buy it and every day she came home and um, she had money in her pocket so that we can buy some food. My dad went to work in a store and my sister, because she knew some English, actually went to a private school and taught English. And every day um, we had to line up for food. There were, no, uh, there were only mom and pop stores going on. And every day you had to line up with other people to get either mantequilla, leche, pan, or pollo, bread, milk, cheese, and chicken. And if you were first in line, you might get everything you wanted. If you were half in line, you might only get half the stuff. And if you were at the end of the line, you might get nothing. And many times my mom came home and she didn't have any food for us to eat. And basically what our diet was, we ate grain. At least three, four times of the week, we ate fried grain. So life continued and I began to go to school. 1947, I'm 10 years old. I've never been to school before. I don't know how to read. I don't know how to write. I can speak German, but I can't read or write German. And now I'm going into school and I can't speak a word of Spanish. I wear different clothes. And uh, it was just a real, real bad time for me. Undisciplined, unmotivated, didn't know what was going on. Teachers believed in corporal punishment. So if you didn't do your homework or you acted out in class like I did, uh, they would take you outside and then they simply would slap you around and they'd take you back into class. And then I was going back into class and I was crying most of the time. And the kids were making fun of me. It was just really, really a difficult time for me going to school. So after a year and a half, after a year, my parents decided that they did not want to stay in Santiago because uh, we didn't have a future there. Since her brother was in Seattle, she asked whether or not we could come here and if he could find a sponsor, which he did. And um, the sponsor was Lippmann, Henry, Harry Lippmann, and he had a bakery right across from Garfield High School. And my mother's uncle, my mother's brother, Uncle Leo, uh, sent us the paper and my mom left us for about a year until she was able to earn enough money for us to come to the States. So my mom went to work at Providence Hospital, which is now Cherry Hill Hospital, and at that time, the nurses' aides lived in the hospital. And so she took care of the nurses, student nurses, sewing uniforms, taking care of the rooms, cleaning and doing whatever was necessary. And when she had enough money, then she went ahead and she sent us, sent the papers and money for us to come. So imagine the three of us being by all ourselves and the leader of the family is gone. And so, 
finally then we decided that we were going to come home too so we left we left santiago took a plane and we went down to miami and from miami we took a greyhound bus to seattle and that took almost over a week we couldn't speak english and my sister was the one who did all the talking we only had enough money for one meal a day for seven days and most of the time my dad didn't eat because he gave my sister and me his food and so we arrived in seattle on january 31st 1949 and uh, it was cold it was snowy and um, we had on our summer clothes and we were, <clears throat> our mom, my mother had an apartment that she found for us right across from horseman school um, and there we are right there on the left hand <clears throat> excuse me right across from horseman school and we started our life here in seattle uh, we shared a duplex apartment with an afro-american family it was one bedroom so there were two families living in this one duplex and um said so welcome to the states again just like in england just like in uh, south america and china nobody could speak a word of english my mom continued working at the uh, hospital my dad found a job at a trans-pacific merchandise company he became a shipping clerk my sister fell in love with a holocaust survivor got married and i started my career at madrona school i lived right across from horse men but they put me in madrona so every day there were no school buses so every day i walked to school and walked back from my school and i was put in the 12th grade i mean fifth grade excuse me and i was 12 years old so why did they put me in the fifth grade simply because i was 12. there were no esl classes there was nobody to help me so i'm sitting there and i can't speak english i can't do the work it was south america all over again just all over again and i went down to the lunchroom for the very first time and i bit into a sandwich for my lunch and i couldn't eat it i couldn't swallow it so what was i eating well i was eating peanut butter for the very first time you know and i started my career at madrona and three months later i was put in the sixth grade at mini and i still couldn't do fifth grade work or fourth grade work or third grade work so i really really had a tough time going through school i went from mini to garfield and i was just you would say a mediocre student that's all i was c's and d's never b's and a's but the University of Washington in 1956 only required a two point to get in. So I made it inside the University of Washington. I joined an a, um, a Pi fraternity, which was the best move I ever made. I still have my fraternity brothers today that I hang out with. And after a couple of quarters, I decided to drop out of the university and I decided to uh, join the Army Reserves. next richard okay at the end of high school too we uh like i said at the very beginning the journey took 18 years and as my senior year in high school my parents and i finally got our naturalization papers and we became citizens of the of the united states okay next so I uh, decided to join the Army Reserve, and I spent six months over at Fort Ord, California, and I spent five and a half years in the reserves. And after I finished uh, my training, I went back to University of Washington. And um, next. Got my degrees in, um, my undergraduate degree and my master's degree and I got my teaching certificate and I became a teacher 
in the Lake Washington School District, starting with at Lake Washington High School the very first year and transferring to uh, Redmond High School and retired in 1999 after about 35 years of teaching. And then I went back and I taught some more when uh, I was a Mr. Teacher teaching honors English classes. So I went after retirement, I went back to teach for a little while, and then I decided to quit. So anyway, I, um, next picture. picture. So this is what we escaped by leaving Germany. Okay. And now I would like you to meet my immediate family. This picture is about uh, three years old. And on the top uh, picture is my son, Joel, who now is a um, teacher in, the, in Olympia High School teaching math. He graduated from Washington State. He's got us BA and MA. And next to him, eating cake, is my granddaughter, Jody, who just celebrated her 22nd birthday yesterday. She graduated from Washington State as an electrical engineer. And next to her is uh, her mom, Kari. She is an administrator in the North Thurston School District uh, for special ed. She's got a PhD. And peeking out behind her is my girl, Kyla. And she is at Western now taking online classes. And below, on the left hand side, is my wife, Jan. We've been married 55 years. And Damaris. Uh, my son Peter met her in Cuba and he fell in love, wanted to get married, and um, we sponsored her to come over here, just like we were sponsored. Then there next to me is my son Peter. Um, he also graduated from Western, got his master's degree in, from Seattle University in teaching, but he couldn't afford to be a teacher, so now he has his own business. Next to him is my girl, Amanda. She's 14. And the guy that's going to carry on the family name, Adrian, right below me. And he's 12. So that's it. That's my family. And um, there you go. Thank you so much, Joe, for sharing this really incredible story. We have a number of questions here from audience members. Um, and I want to start with one of them, um, with all of your traveling and moving around. Um, we're wondering if you ever returned to Shanghai, and if so, what was that experience like? No, I never returned to uh, Shanghai, but I did return to Germany. As a senior, my son uh, was an exchange student from Western. And uh, he spent uh, six months in Germany living with a German family. And uh, I never wanted to go back to Germany. My parents would never buy anything from Germany, not cheese, not a car, they wouldn't anything. And I didn't want to go back either. But then my son actually uh, prompted me to go back. And we spent a whole month over there traveling all over Germany, Austria, and also uh, Czechoslovakia but I never did go back to Shanghai. Well, that, that ties right into another question we received, which was from Eugene, who asked, how do you feel about Germany today? Um, and especially in terms of how the nation educates its people about the Holocaust. Well, I don't have any uh, resentments against Germany. I um, taught German for 35 years in addition to other subjects. And I had many, many German exchange students at Redmond High School for about 30 years. And they learned about the Holocaust. And also, many of them never heard about the Holocaust. I think that Germany in itself is doing a great job in teaching the Holocaust. And uh, they make it a crime to be anti-Semitic and to be anti-Holocaust. So um, I think they're doing a really good job in educating it. Unfortunately, with the rise of the far right, that's something that Germany is fighting right now. So Patricia asks, and you referenced this a little bit, but as a retired teacher, um, 
did you teach the Holocaust and did you learn about the Holocaust when you were in school? What, what was that like for you in the education system? I never, um, like I said, I never learned anything in there about the Holocaust in the uh, Seattle Public Schools. Maybe um, they might have mentioned it, but they didn't do an in-depth study. I went ahead and I taught the Holocaust when I was teaching history. And I taught it basically by myself. I didn't teach or learn it at the university, but with the help of the Humanities Center, as well as movies that I got from Germany, I was able to uh, construct a curriculum teaching the Holocaust as part of a historical history unit. Yes. So Martin writes, did the extent and challenges of your childhood journey leave you any time for joy and fun? No, to be honest with you, <laughs> looking, by, looking back upon my childhood, it really sucked. You know, it really, really sucked. Uh, you know, you have to imagine the, my parents' life. It was survival. Every day was survival. The 1920s was, uh, you know, the rise of anti-Semitism. The 1930s was um, Shanghai and uh, South America the 1940s coming to the States, we always had to start over again. We were poor, only having the clothes on our back. Every single day that I remember was a day of survival, to listen to my parents, trying to figure out how they're gonna get through the day, how they're gonna survive the next day without any knowledge of the culture, the language, the money. It was just really struggle. I mentioned that I was 10 years old, and the first time I ever went to the zoo, the problems that I had in school, the bullying, the, you know, and not being able to do any of the work. I think that life for me as a kid really sucked. Yeah, from your recollections, I mean, it sounds like it was incredibly difficult. And um, there's a, a question here um, that asks, you had experiences in school that might have turned you away, but you ended up as a teacher yourself and your children followed you as teachers. What, so I wanna build on that and ask, you know, what, what motivated you and inspired you to become a teacher? And were there some teachers that maybe helped, helped you to become teachers, helped you to become a teacher? Well, you know, that's a good question. I kind of uh, skipped over the fact that I flunked out of school at the university. And that's primarily because I was a poor student. I never learned how to study. And I went back to school, after I joined the army, I went back to school and I was really, really motivated to do well. And I met a friend of mine who was German and she was a, lived in Germany at the same time I did. And we became really, really good friends. And here I was a survivor and she was a citizen of Germany. And the question she always asked me, if you were an average citizen and you saw what the Germans did to the Jews and you realized what would happen to you if you spoke up, what would you do? And the fact was that we became very, very good friends. She was a teacher and she motivated me to become a teacher and we actually together started the German program in the Lake Washington School District. But the question was, what would you do if you were an average German citizen and you saw them beating up Jews and killing them? What would you do? She asked me that question all the time. She said, what would you do if you were in my shoes? And I couldn't answer that question. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. I'm, and I'm not sure if any of us know what we would do until we were actually in it. That's right. Yeah. Um, there's another question here that came up a couple times. How did your uncle Leo end up in Seattle? You know, it's a good question, Lana. Lana I don't know. I don't know. I know that the uh, family uh, in South America went directly to Santiago, but I really don't know the answer. And my sister is no longer alive that can ask that question. So 
we have time for just one final question. And I want to ask you about your mom, who you told me um, before we started today, lived to be 102. And I'm wondering, your mom was, was quite a force, uh, really driving your family from one, one place to the other. What, what advice do you think she might have for all of us today? You know, let me put it to you this way. A friend of mine once gave me a t-shirt. And on this t-shirt, there was an inscription that said, life is what happens to you while you make other plans. And the question then comes up is, if life is what happens to you while you make other plans, do you show up for life? And she showed up for life. She did what she had to do. Remember at the very beginning, I said, Es ist wie es ist und man macht das Beste, was man kann. It is what it is and you have to do the best you can. You have to show up for life. She was resilient. Both my parents were resilient. Imagine that they were married close to 60 years. My mother left us all alone. She could have just said, the heck with you guys. I'm going to start my life over again. You can just stay over there. But she didn't do that. She didn't desert us. And the same thing goes with my dad. They were a great team together. They supported each other until they passed away. And they both showed up for life because they did what they had to do in order to survive. I love that. I love that. Thank you so, so much, Joe, for sharing these stories with us today, for telling us about your growing up and your family. I want to also thank your wife, Jan, who's um, in the background and has you know, just been supporting oh, Jane, you from sure. behind there um, and helping out with the technology as well. We're, we're so lucky to have you as part of our speakers, Rio, Joe, and, and, um, and that you continue to be with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I want to also take a moment to um, thank our partner today, the Moshe House Seattle. And this program was recorded and you'll find it on our website starting tomorrow along with other past Lunch and Learn presentations. It takes a dedicated team to keep the Holocaust Center running at full speed with virtual presentations like this one, our Speakers Bureau, professional development for teachers, creating online resources, offering book discussion groups, a student leadership board, and so much more. And these programs would not be possible without the generous support of our donors. If you'd like to support our virtual programming and the center's mission, please check out our website, holocaustcenterseattle.org. I want to give a special thank you to Richard Green, our museum and technology director, who is running the technical side of this show behind the scenes. Also a huge thank you to our executive director, Dee Simon, and our entire team, Nicole Bella, Lori Rushel cohen Julia Thompson, Paul Regelbrug, Rosa Campos, Sydney Drado, Ellie Selesky, Amanda Davis, and Katie Lawrence. Thank you also to Michelle Quinones who provided closed captioning for us today. Be sure to join us next week for an opportunity to hear from Professor Clyde Ford, author of Think Black. Professor Ford will speak about his father, the first black software engineer in America and his relationship with technology, IBM, and the Holocaust. What began as a story about his father soon enlarged into a cautionary tale about the dark side of technology and his recommendations about what must change. Thank you so much for joining us for this program today and we look forward to seeing you all next week. This concludes our program.